I think math with letters is harder. Huh? <laughs> Our pilot was talking, was doing some uh, math calculations. Uh, math with the letters. I get it. I noticed I didn't really, I, I had you toggled on. Sorry about that. <laughs> I just didn't realize you weren't talking to us. We've got some comments asking when the next dive is scheduled. We are currently in the, in the middle of this dive. It looks like we're ascending. <laughs> we are just uh, traversing from one uh, one summit to the next. So when we're in a uh, downslope, it's uh, difficult to see much just because of the way that the ROV and the, is angled as opposed to how the slope is angled. Um, we're watching weather conditions to see when we will schedule our next dive. So as far as getting to the next summit, like it, it's barely physically possible in the time that's left with the dive, but we'll definitely get back to um, the seafloor and be traversing up. So I think it's it's still worthwhile, even if we don't get back up to that summit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's okay if we don't make it to the sum second summit, but I definitely want to get back to the seafloor um, sooner rather than later. So whenever we're comfortable. We have, we down have a plan. Now. Plan is in place. Awesome. Again, a question for you from the chat. Do marine biologists have favorite fish, or are there just too many? I mean, it depends on who you ask. Yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of favorites. So does that mean, like, I have a favorite or I don't have a favorite? Like, it changes. My brother was little, you know, you'd ask him what his favorite color was, and he'd name, like, five. Like, then that's not your, like, one favorite. I don't know. I, I don't think I can pick one favorite. It's sort of like asking someone what your favorite book is. And you're like, well, there's so many different books out there. A lot of them have things that are your favorite. And some people can, like, automatically tell you what their favorite movie or favorite book is. But I've always had a problem with that. Wuthering Heights? There's just too many. Wuthering Heights is not my favorite book. Okay. <laughs> no, just, no judgments. It could totally just, be your nope, favorite book. Nope. She just gave me a look, guys. <laughs> not that it's a bad book. It just definitely wasn't um, my favorite. Uh, it took some getting into, definitely. Yeah, I tend to enjoy a lot more science fiction. I like sci-fi. No, I like Regency era, but I mean, like, if I'm going to choose, like, something in that genre, it's going to be Jane Eyre, not Wuthering Heights. But um, I love my, love me some sci-fi, love me some fantasy. I guess that's Georgian, not Regency. Before I get a a lit major in the chat correcting me. <laughs> oh, I could uh, I could pick my favorite fish of the day. Ooh, okay. Like you know that that that's something that we could do. Definitely couldn't do favorite of all time. That's too hard. 
Did you have a favorite from yesterday's dive, or was that, or not dive, yesterday's watch, or was that too far away to remember? Yeah, no, I had a favorite from yesterday's watch. That was that uh, Cuskiel that we saw. Oh, yeah, the long fin, right? With the long fin. Yeah, that was uh, Magistopterus Imperator. It was only the second time that we've been able to image that animal subsea. And it might also be a depth extension for that fish. Um, previously, the records were only known from two, uh, 2,300 meters, uh, and we were at 27. So that's pretty cool. I, I think that that was a really exciting find. That is cool. So that's my favorite fish of the dive. Yeah, truly, we don't know how deep things dive until we see them, right? So Exactly. Well, we can only, you know, say what we've observed. Uh, so... You know, science in the deep ocean is constantly being revised, especially the taxonomy of a lot of these animals is constantly being revised as we learn more. So, you know, what I might say an uh, organism's name is today might not be its name tomorrow, just because we'll learn more about that animal and, and be able to give it a more accurate name. Uh, as we've been doing more genetic testing on some of these animals, uh, the taxonomy has been revised just because we find out things that we thought were different the same or things we thought were the same are actually different. Yeah, there is a, a, a name that you keep mentioning, but then also mention that it used to be whatever the change was. I can't remember which one it was. Yeah, that was the uh, Romilla Gorgia Militaris. Yes. Uh, that was the dominant... Uh, coral during our early, our watch yes, last night and uh, in the morning too. We just kept seeing that coral over and over and over again. Um, it used to be called Pleurogorgia militaris, but it was recently revised to Romilogorgia. Why did it get revised? Like, what did they discover about it? Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, what the reasoning was behind the taxonomic change. Uh, I would have to read the paper, and I haven't gotten to reading that one yet. There are so many papers to read. There is. There are so many papers to read. I just know that that name had changed recently. It's really all you need to know. Yeah. Um, so actually, uh, to find out how taxonomy has changed and for the most up-to-date version of accepted taxonomic names, I use a website called Worms. It's a database. Um, the World Register of Marine Organisms. And it is a great tool for uh, looking up the taxonomy of animals that we're seeing. Uh, I also use it for spelling uh, because <laughs> these are really hard names to spell sometimes. And, uh, you know, I could rattle off the name, but doesn't mean that I, I can spell it correctly every single time. So especially when I'm doing important work, I make sure I copy and paste so I always spell it right. Did you say it was called worms, as in like earthworms? Yeah, worms, like in earthworms, but with a small o. So that is a really good resource. Comet said the revision was due to it being awful to find a rhyme with at the annual marine biologist world haiku championships. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sounds, sounds about right. Sounds legitimate. All right. We'll take sure, it. Sure. I'll go for it. <laughs> we can work on our haikus later.
for those just tuning in. I know the views might look a little like we are ascending, but we are in fact traversing from one summit to another. We're currently on a downslope, so it, there isn't much to see due to the uh, angle of the cameras. Taxonomy question from the chat. Do you ever look up old scientific literature or is it always new papers? I guess that would depend on whether there was a new paper written on the topic, right? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of old papers that are really informative, uh, especially from some of the first expeditions that were sampling deep sea organisms. Um, we definitely look at those papers and taxonomists that are trying to describe new species will always look through all the literature before describing a new species because you got to confirm that you know that is actually a new species to science um, you don't want to be giving you know the same animal multiple names we definitely don't want to overcount uh, how many different species that we've discovered so you know you definitely have to confirm what that animal is by reviewing all of the literature and there, there are new papers coming out all the time uh, describing new species. And there are a lot of species yet to be discovered. So there is no lack of work here for people who want to do deep sea taxonomy, that's for sure. Um, but nowadays, there aren't as many taxonomists. So uh, if you're looking for a field to get into, um, taxonomy could be something of interest because there aren't that many people out there doing some of this work. Just looking for somebody to share your annotation with, your annotation piece. Oh yeah, so uh, <laughs> we have a group of experts uh, located around the world that we contact uh, and send imagery to to help us confirm some of the identifications that we're using in our video annotations. Um, that's especially true when we're putting together deep sea animal guides. We want to make sure that we have some taxonomous input uh, about what those animals are. Um, that way we're giving the most up-to-date and uh, best information possible uh, about the identification of those animals. And our deep sea animal guides are always on, under constant revision. Uh, as we get more information, um, those animal guides will be updated. And do you use, uh, do you have librarians to help you find what you're looking for, or do you use particular resources to find the literature? Um, usually, I just use the internet to find literature. The internet? Yeah, that's a wonderful place. Google Scholar can be really helpful in locating papers of interest to you. Um, but yes, there are librarians at the University of Hawaii who are very helpful, who will help you find papers that you're interested in. So uh, you can contact them. If the school does not have access to those papers, there are other avenues you can use in order to find that paper, like interlibrary loans and uh, uh, contacting other libraries in order to get gain access to some more elusive literature. WorldCat is a lovely system. <laughs> A uh, question about have we found any new or exciting things from the samples? Well, everything's exciting, but it takes a while to know if something is actually new or not, doesn't it? Exactly. Um, we can suspect that something is new, but 
We can't say for sure until it's been confirmed by taxonomist. A lot of times, some of these animals we think are new or something that's been settled a long time ago, but no one's ever seen it alive, and so they actually look different. Um, and after reviewing the material, you can actually sort of put a face to a name, which is also very important. And that helps us uh, expand our visual search guide or our animal identification guide. Um, that way, as we do more surveys, we can provide better annotations, better identifications. Okay. So every dive, we learn a lot. Got some definite taxonomy fans this morning. Uh, is uh, taxonomic classification always followed up by genetic sequencing? Or is most of the classification done via, via physical characteristics? So in the past, yes, it was always physical characteristics based on um, you know, sclerites in you know, terms of corals or spicules in terms of sponges. Uh, but now with um, our, e now that it's easier to sequence DNA and do uh, genetic testing, we're actually, you know, building our libraries of DNA and it's becoming more mainstream to, to do genetic testing. So... You know, maybe in the future we might be going more that avenue versus making uh, identifications based on morphology. But I don't think identifications based on morphology are going to go by the wayside because, you know, we do have all this video. We can't collect everything all the time. So being able to identify something based on how it looks like is really helpful when reviewing video from ROVs. We have to look for certain characters in order to provide that uh, identification. Um, but in addition, uh, we are collecting water samples, and our water samples will pro be processed for environmental DNA. And so that environmental DNA sort of uh, shows us what's in the community uh, at the location where that water was collected. And so environmental DNA might be a way for the future to sort of quickly survey what might be in an area just using a water sample. I think eDNA is pretty fascinating. It is. It's a really, really cool new tool that we have been using in the scientific field. Um, and it's something that we are currently doing on the ship, is collecting eDNA samples and processing them. I really feel we should like call it eco DNA because mm -hmm. eDNA sounds like it's electronic DNA, <laughs> which is not not quite right. Have we come across accidentally come across sunken ships on our dives while exploring sea life? Uh, that kind of thing would partially show up as a feature in uh, mapping, wouldn't it? Not at, the, not at the steps, probably yeah. not. It'd be really surprising because we'd get like one one sounding in 100 meters or so. Um, it, but if we had, we're shallower, yeah, for sure. Or if we had a sonar closer to the seafloor, for sure. Chat question, what are we hoping to find? What are our dive objectives, Megan? So our dive objectives of today were to uh, transverse this flank of the seamount uh, from deep to shallow. So we have reached the summit and now we're still, you know, here at the summit going to another location on the summit and that's why we're in the blue water. But we are looking to uh, survey and sample some of the benthic fauna and then also collect rock and paired water samples um, across the um, transect that we made up the, the slope of this seamount. So we, we collected rocks and water samples at regular intervals on our way up throughout our dive, and those are going to be processed 
for geology. Coralie, do you want to talk about uh, what you're doing with your samples and, and the water samples? Yeah, sure. So we do have bottom in sight. If you guys um, can see the sonar, the meso. Uh, sorry. No, uh, so the idea, so we're looking at from manganese crust. Um, those are, that's the black stuff on the rocks that if you were watching the dive before you saw, you can't really see them right now. Um, but they form over millions of years and they precipitate out of the seawater onto hard substrate. And what kind of controls their composition is the seawater. So we're looking at seawater, specifically cobalt content, and to see if there's a relationship between seawater cobalt content and ferromanganese crust cobalt content. Just to kind of help elucidate some more things about them so you can figure out a little bit more about how they become so enriched in some of these metals. Um, the focus for this specific project is on cobalt, but we might be able to expand it further to some other metals, which would be cool. Awesome. So we have bottom Here back in go. sight. We are ready to head back down and continue our survey. Yeah, if you can see those black rocks, those are the ferromanganese crust. But we do have, so we have six rocks and actually I think we have seven rocks and we have six Niskin pairs, Niskin water pairs for the rocks. So right now we're looking for a sea cucumber for Megan to take back to a student at UH. Yeah, our goal is to collect a nice big one that has a lot of gut contents because I think we should keep one steps of going. PhD students at the University of Hawaii is using the gut contents of sea cucumbers in order to understand a little bit more about the abyssal food web by looking at stable isotopes. And using those stable isotopes, she'll be able to um, figure out where the food is coming from in the ocean. Yes. So we are looking for the sea cucumber with the best dad bod. Yeah. We want something nice and uh, big and firm. Did I hear that right? Yes, he did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> If we want good, <laughs> a lot of gut contents, that. I'm assuming it would have something of a beer gut. We're talking after Thanksgiving is ideal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just full, full of food, just consuming all those sediments. And ideally, we get that sea cucumber back with all those gut contents intact. Got a question about how long the lines are to the ROVs. So all of the uh, ROV deets are on our Nautilus dot uh, Nautilus Live dot org website. Um, if you scroll down to live data on the right side, there's a picture of both ROVs, and you can click on them to get their specifications. Um, Hercules can go down to about four thousand meters. Someone asked if we get tired of explaining things so many times during a dive. Um, ask as many questions as you want, and we will explain it as often as you'd like, because everybody deserves the chance to learn something new. And you uh, submit questions by going to nautiluslive.org. If you scroll down a bit more, you'll see a, send, a box that says send a message to our team. As long as it's green, the dot is green. It says our team is in the control room and ready for your questions, and we are indeed.
So it looks like we have some uh, Candigella gigantea corals growing on these rocks. Those are those long with like coral. Okay, I should probably go up the slope. There's a sea cucumber. Oh yeah, that that's a nice big one. SPL, do you uh, like it for a potential sample, or are we just taking a look? Um, yeah, let's let's see if we can collect this. Bridge and Av, hold position. Ah, who's driving this thing? There we go. You don't have to race, but we do have to be efficient about it. That's all we can ever ask. I'm going to Argus a bit. Oh, that's a bit nerve-wracking. Oh, never mind. Yeah. Excitement begins. It's just, it's just right there. It's right there. Bio box B is open. Or er, no. you can put it in bio box B. I'm like ready to punch in there. Yeah, right side. Nicely done. Nice. Okay, leave the arm right there. That right. was sample zero four nine. Okay, we're coming up right now. Zero four nine, Roger. You can just leave it. Turn the hydraulics off. Stow it later. We gotta move ASAP. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Good job, Getting team. sporty all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little nerve wracking. Yeah, I'm. I'm not unnervous done. yet. <laughs> We are still in the danger, woods. Danger zone. I'm going to not go anywhere for the moment. Yeah. Hmm. I need to use the lateral. Get a little more vertical speed. Oh, yeah. We'll be fine. Not by much, but we'll be fine. <laughs> it's a very good cliff. Mm, indeed. Yeah, this nice rock formation we got here. It's right there. Well, there's a very wispy looking Chrysogorgia. we get to the top here, Antonella, can you ditch a plate, please? Nice. We're not at the top yet. You can digit play now. Yeah, why don't I just 
do this. Okay. Oh, wait, no, we're smoothing out. Don't worry about it. Never mind. Can we check out that sponge? Negative. No? Okay. All these little corals here, those are more of those Romiligorgia militaris. All right, I'm confident we're not going to die now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but I'm not ready for a ship move. Roger. <laughs> All right, I can do this if you want to ditch a plate. Here it is. Yeah, just grab the top. Uh, yeah, no, it sags. Yeah, kill the hydraulics. You see the dangly rope? Kind of 45 off the left there. Yeah. Just grab that and it'll come free. All right, now we'll be able to be safe. And you can steal the arm. Spotted a tree to plura sponge. Okay, now we're good for looking around or a ship move or both. That cliff has flattened out now, which is lovely and less scary. <laughs> all right, um, all right. Ready, ready to go? Science, all good to go? I'm good to go. Okay. Bridge nav, uh, five zero meters, one six five, please. So it looks like we've got a few things here. This in the middle of the screen is a Trita pleura type of glass sponge. And then these, uh, there's a whole bunch of small Chrysogorgids. I'll use my little counter. Count how many there are. There's one there too. On there. Seven. That's crazy. So uh, bathopathies, and then there's a parentopathy. Can I get front porch bubble, please? Or are you doing gauges? Do you do gauges? That's good. Yeah, no, no hurry at all. We've got some questions about the purpose of dropping the metal plate. That's ballast adjustment. So rocks are heavy. So to replace the buoyancy that we lost by gra grabbing rocks, we drop weight. So it's a steel plate and a hemp line. That way it'll, you leave it on the bottom and it'll disappear. It'll rust away into nothingness mm. given enough time. Here we have another Aritagorgia Magnus Spiralis. And then there are some uh, Antipatherians right near the base there. There is a um, from Noah Coral. What was our bearing there? Uh, 165. Thank you.
that we are questionably achieving. We're doing what? Hmm. Exactly. <laughs> She just put a heading change in, so. Oh, okay. Uh, looking at the chat here, yes, all of your uh, ROV specification questions can be answered by nautiluslive.org. Just go to live data on the right-hand side and click on one of the uh, images of the ROVs. It will tell you the specification. So it can go to about 4,000 meters deep, roughly. What is the record for Hercules, do we know? The record for what? Hercules diving. The record? Yeah. I mean, I know that we can go about 4,000 meters, but, you know. Oh, for depth? Yeah. Depth record, yeah. 3980, I think. Nice. I don't know. I'm pulling that number kind of out of thin air. <laughs> Close enough. Can we take a look at uh, eight, 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 eight. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Why was it just eight? <laughs> uh, I think the last thing I counted was seven, and I didn't realize it was still on the counter. It's <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> okay, zoom in on eight, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a nice looking Walteria sponge. The sponge in the family Euplectality. Whoa, sorry. Sometimes I like to think of this sponge as the hairy sponge because it has all these uh, little little side branches that come off the main uh, part of the sponge. So the sponge is actually a vase shape um, that uh, has a lattice to it. And oftentimes you might see a shrimp living inside there, or I think in this case there was a brittle star that was entwined into the side of this glass sponge. Ooh, this sponge right here looks like it could be the E.T. sponge. I hope it is. Let's zoom in on it. So the Go opposite ahead. side of this sponge would have those uh, oh, openings that looks side. like E.T.'s head. Killing me, Megan. That's a very firm stalk. It looks like a lollipop stick. It does. So this sponge is Avena Magnifica, meaning Magnificent Alien. Bonk, imminent. Common name, E.T. Sponge. And uh, it got that moniker when it didn't have a true name. Because people think it looks like the head of that very famous alien, extraterrestrial. Oh, what? There's the bonk. I was like, why is there no bonk? <laughs> bonk. Everyone put your finger out and say hi to it. Phone home. It's just... Which is hilarious because someone in the chat did ask if some sponges have tentacles like corals. Mm -hmm. Looks like this one did not. No, well, they wouldn't have tentacles in the same way a coral would have a tentacle. The animal has uh, cilia that will help move things. And they all beat together in order to uh, move water throughout the skeleton of the sponge. So all sponges mm -hmm. are very full of holes, and uh, water will flow through those holes.
I wandered off again. What's this stocked thing on top of this dead stocked thing? We have a caliphacus sponge. That's the nice live stocked thing. And and that long part could have been a previous sponge. So um, can we zoom in? Are they connected, that long stock and, and the Go live Go ahead and zoom stock? in. I would say they are not they, connected. They are not connected. All right. That's what I thought, right, but thanks. then I wasn't sure for a moment there. I framed it up just in such a way that it confused you. It did. It did confuse me. <laughs> but that would have been really weird if uh, there was a split there. Uh, we do sometimes see caliphacus sponges with multiple little head poofs. And uh, that is a could be a new species, but that one did not have multiple poofs. Here's our friend Romilla Gorgia Militaris. And then there's a Tritopleura sponge that is partially dead, but could still be doing okay for itself. It's a Chrysogorgia coral. Oh, there's a fish, fish. over to the uh, left-hand side just off the screen. It's very skinny right there. Oh, look at that. Go ahead and zoom when you think you got it. Well, that's pointy. Oh, yes, this looks like a Netasoma parviceps. A Netastomatomy. Stomatity. It's a type of eel, sometimes called a sorceress eel. You can see it has a little uh, tube Thanks. on the end of its nose. That's pretty cute. What does that tube do? Um, not quite sure. More sponges. Those long leafy sponges are the tree de pleura. And the little mushroom looking sponge is the caliphacus. So someone in the chat wants to know, how do sponges reproduce? How do we get all these sponges? Um, so sponges will reproduce by sending out gametes into the water column and then they will meet up and a zygote and eventually that uh, will settle down uh, it could it gets carried by currents to a new location and uh, that larva will eventually settle and start to grow in a new location so that's sort of how it works for sponges and the same thing applies to corals But not much is known about the uh, the timing of when they'll send out their gametes. There must be some sort of timing. Uh, in shallow water, uh, corals will uh, time the release of their gametes to the uh, lunar cycle most often, so that you know all these gametes are in the water at the same time, so they can meet up. 
but work is still being done uh, to figure out when corals and sponges in the deep sea um, do that same thing and how, how do they know when to, to do that is a big question. Is it random chance? Uh, do they do it based on tides and lunar cycles? How do they know? Could it be like trees with the fungus network? But I don't know uh, what would be the equivalent of a fungus network in the ocean. Hmm. Do we definitively know that there's no fungus networking? Um, Every time I've asked someone about fungus in the ocean, they're like, yeah, it's probably there, but no one's really studied it. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good point. I'm not sure how fungus would work in the ocean. I have no idea how fungus works on land, so. <laughs> fungus is pretty weird. Young scientists, apparently there is a need for, or I should just say new scientists, there is a need for uh, deep sea fungus research, apparently. Get out there and do it. Is it there? Is it there? Yeah. there? First question. Can you imagine your thesis being deep sea fungus and then you, your whole thing is like, it's not there? <laughs> <laughs> wow. What a letdown. Well, that's how science works, right? Totally. Let's propose something and then see if it's true. And then, you know, 50 years from now, you might find out that it was true after all. And you just didn't even know. We just weren't looking hard enough. Maybe it's not fungus. Maybe it's something else that we we don't even know. A whole other kingdom? Mm-hmm. Ooh, we haven't had a new kingdom in ages. This isn't a new kingdom, but it could be bacterial, too. I don't know. I'm totally starting conspiracies here, but... The, the virus network? Yeah. Can it be a conspiracy if it ends in a question mark? <laughs> only a conspiracy when you're like this is the truth i could say it with more confidence <laughs> yeah more sort of yeah sort of conspiracy you say it with confidence someone else starts to believe it did you know about the virus network and subsea virus network people would believe you if you told them it's how sponges communicate the et sponge is their leader <laughs> yeah bridge nine another five zero meters one six five what's going on with this coral over here what are you is it like a dead sponge next to a coral, or? Um, I'm gonna say yes. That sounds like a great guess. Yeah, or, or it's damaged it in, or something. Other oh, bonus corals to the right too. Oh yeah. Okay. We got. Oh, there's a lot of coral right here. Oh my goodness. Um. So we got some uh, hemichorallium. We've got chrysogorgid, and we've got a dead sponge with hydroids all over it. And then behind it, I think there's another sponge. And down to the right, there's a. Militaris, maybe? Um, oh. oh, yeah, you are right. Good eye. Uh, actually, that might be an Aritagorgia. Oops. Not sure. It's kind of spiraling. Or a sort of sad looking Militaris. Hello, floaty white thing. Here's another Caliphacus on a very, very long stalk. Oh, that's a dead sponge. 
was like, ooh, something interesting, but it was just dead sponge. <laughs> Some more hemichorallium, some Perea neuroca erecta, Walteria sponge. These are very skinny Walteria. That's a really pretty sponge, nice face sponge. That's one of those uh, Septura flora, could be a Tritodictidae. So those are related to the Tritopleura. Lots of Chrysogorgia. There's a white sea cucumber down there, nestled inside the rocks. What was that? Sorry, you wanted to look at something by the rocks? Um, you know, can we Just look observing? at this thing? Sure. The white pokey? Yeah, that white pokey thing. Is it a coral? Okay, this zoom in, please. Looking end on right now. It is a coral. It is a bamboo coral. And all the polyps are on one side. So this could be a bathygorgia bamboo coral. Cool. Okay, come on, please. I had a very uh, dense, milky looking tissue. It was really hard to see the nodes under that tissue. But I could tell that it was a bamboo coral because it had those long intertentacular spines. Another one of those long arm, maybe a sternum stylus sweat lobster on top of that coral that we just passed over. Or totally branching bamboo coral, possibly Jason Isis. These are some really long mm. Chrysogorgia. These long bottle brush colonies. Really gorgeous. A very sparse aridogorgia. 
Can we take a look at this? Isn't that the one we've been seeing all dive? I think this, uh, it could be a primnoid. Go ahead and um, zoom, please. Not sure. It's not in the greatest shape. It's definitely had better days. It's like the middle fell off. Oh, uh, yeah. This one's got really small polyps, so this might be something like Paracalyptrophora. It's just missing a lot of branches. Have a rock rolled through the middle of it or something? Or a fish swam? Oh, we saw a fish? No, never mind. <laughs> oh, okay. I wonder if a fish swam through the middle of it and broke it. Well, it could happen. Vandal fish. It's happened before. I've seen it. Can we see what this little yellow one is? Yeah. I think it might be a Staropathies. That type of black coral. Zoom in, please. It looks very similar to bathopathies, but it'll have sub-branching on its outer branches. Maybe not at this age? Maybe not at this one. This is very, very tiny. It could be a bathopathies, too. It's a pretty good community of corals here. Sort of transversing across this little ridge between the two summits. Can we look at this if, if we have time? Yeah. Just got to jam on the brakes here. That one looks a little bit like a sparse brancher. It's uh, definitely a, a bamboo coral. Fish, too. Oh, and there's a fish. Let's snap zoom on the fish first. Uh. Okay, zoom on the fish, please. <laughs> 